Ed Nelson. Thank you, Nikki. Welcome everybody. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Like Nikki said, today we're going to discuss Boreal laser gas detection. Um, we're very excited to have Boreal as a manufacturing partner with Vector Controls and Automation. Uh, it's, a, it's a newer line for Vector Controls, uh, but like I said, we're extremely excited to have it as part of our Fire and Gas System Solutions uh, group. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the, the laser gas detection. This here in front of me is an open path or line of sight uh, transceiver. Uh, for laser gas detection and right here we have the analyzer box if you will with an HMI touch screen on it and Kyle will be going into a lot more detail uh, on both of these pieces here as well as a few other uh, laser gas detection units. Uh, as you can see here to my side uh, as well we have a safety system set up here with some horns and strobes and manual calls. The laser gas detection system uh, can be tied into any safety system really on the market it has uh, several different communication options uh, and can, like I said, can be a standalone device uh, or can be another layer of, of protection uh, in your fire and or gas safety system. Kyle, turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chet. Uh, as Chet mentioned, my name is Kyle McDonald and I'm with Boreal Laser. Uh, we develop and manufacture laser-based gas analysis solutions. We have a, a number of different uh, measurement head configurations for industrial leak detection applications or in situ monitoring applications as well. So uh, today, the, the, the bulk of the focus will be on the industrial leak detection side of the business, uh, particularly with the equipment configuration uh, that we have right here is the, the open path measurement head, uh, which is a, a line of sight measurement, a laser based uh, line of sight measurement. Uh, but at, at the end, we can also touch on the in situ uh, measurement head uh, options as well as for process monitoring and control applications as well. So very excited and happy for all of you to join us here today to learn a, a little bit more about the about the gas detection world. So before we start, I really want to emphasize why why this particular equipment, this enhanced sensing element is so important for your facility's fire and gas safety system. So in the screen, the Chad screen, what you're seeing right here to his right, uh, what you're looking at is the, the parts and components uh, that can fully formulate a complete fire and gas safety system. So why customers, why you as an end user would have a, a whole fire and gas safety system is purely for the purpose of risk mitigation. Uh, think of it as a as sort of an insurance policy uh, that with physical hardware, uh, along with your fine gas safety system, this will enable the recovery after a loss of containment as soon as possible. That's that's really the emphasis and the reason why uh, your facility either has a, a wholly standalone fire and gas safety system or why your system would use a, an SIS uh, loop or system to control this or whether it may be tied into your BPCS system as well. And what we really want to emphasize with all of you today is with this enhanced sensing technology, um, your safety system is only as strong as its weakest link, just like a, just like a chain. So even though you may have the top of the line uh, logic solver, uh, PLC, DCS, or the EQP, which you see in Chad's screen as well, uh, you can spend all this time, effort, and money on your bow tie arrangements, all your engineering to develop the executive actions that are required to uh, happen after a loss of containment has been confirmed. Uh, but the big thing, what we want to share with you and share the knowledge that we have and educate all of you about this enhanced safety system is with this particular sensing element, this increases the odds of you detecting the leak because this is an open path or line of sight instrument. Uh, the odds of detecting are also increased because of the speed of response that this product and this technology has. Traditional fixed point gas detectors, think of electrochemical sensors, think of uh, cat feed sensors. Those take on order anywhere from 10 seconds, 30 seconds, and in some cases, all the way up to, to three or five minutes, uh, depending on the gas and depending on the weather shrouding. Uh, that is at those locations as well. So the line of sight, in, the line of sight measurements that we have here, 
enable much, much larger area coverage compared to the, the one inch contact surface area. We have much faster speed of response of one independent sample every single second. And often we have very, very low uh, detection thresholds that we can alarm if it's a combustible gas, we can alarm in percent concentrations. Think LEL or LFL meter applications, or in the case of toxic gases, uh, we can say, we can, most times we can see sub PPM concentrations uh, for these arrangements as well. So to kind of tie the conversation together and really kind of put a bow and introduction to our topic of conversation here today, it really is, is your sensing elements, just like this, the items that can detect the loss and containment are vitally important uh, to, to, to communicate and talk with the, the EQP, the logic solver that is in Chad's screen here. So it can implement an executive action like shutting down an HVAC system or turning it on, uh, enunciating horns and strobes, exercising relays, opening, closing valves, et cetera. So it is vitally important for your safety system to be as effective as possible, you have to have the best possible sensing elements to maximize the likelihood of detecting that loss of containment or the leak. And plus you wanna do it as fast as possible. So those executive actions that are carried out by your safety system can happen as soon as possible because the faster we detect the leak, the faster we can act. And the faster you act, the, the odds of protecting people, personnel and assets uh, increase as well. Right, Kyle, and, and one thing you did mention was speed of response. And so one thing I wanna point out is that these laser gas detectors are active fail-safe gas detectors, right? They never go into a sleep mode. Kyle said, you know, they're, they're looking for a measurement every second. Uh, they do not go into a sleep mode, so they're extremely quick to respond, um, which is important for a safety system. There are some some systems or equipment out there that go into a sleep mode to conserve power or maybe a battery uh, and, and that can lead to much longer um, time for you to recognize that there is a gas leak. Uh, this, this, this type of unit will not do that and if for any reason it cannot see or read gas it will let you know by indicating a fault. Chad you bring up a very good point and this is an excellent segue uh, into our next section here. So we, we talked about the whole fire and gas safety system and how you need to have all the best sensing elements, the best uh, logic controller system, and the best final control elements you can have possible to build the strongest possible safety system. But I wanna take this uh, moment here to introduce the equipment uh, that is uh, with Chad and with myself as well. So uh, what you're looking at here is our live video demo board. So what we have here at the, the factory is we have our equipment configuration. We have the, the product that we have here. This is the Gas Finder 3 MC. So what this, this, what this product is, this is based off of laser-based gas detection technology. But more specifically, this is tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy. So you may hear it called laser-based gas detection or uh, TDL or anything else like that, but it's all premised off of the same application as well. So what we have here is our analyzer enclosure. Uh, this is fully suitable for a hazardous air environment. It is still too suitable as well, so it can be integrated into your SIS system as well. So inside of this enclosure, it is very easy to install and integrate into your system. So inside of this enclosure, we have the laser analyzer module which houses the laser and all the control electronics. We have our power and communication monitor, or power and communication uh, termination section. So you run your 24 volt DC, you have your heart output communication, you have your relay outputs, Modbus, whatever have you, uh, it is right here as well. Uh, down at the bottom is where we connect all of our measurement heads. And on the front, what is uh, unique about this particular product is there's a HMI touchscreen uh, that accompanies uh, this particular product uh, as well. So for here, the laser and electronics are mounted in this box. The power is running here, your communication outputs come out of here. And for this particular product, you can connect up to four different measurement head configurations to this one unit. Um, so you can make four completely independent measurements uh, with four different measurement heads to create four independent active measurement paths. Um, 
To help explain what this product or technology does, laser-based gas detection is really a simple premise of operation. Uh, what we do is we emit laser light that shines from our transceiver. What has happened here? I'll show you a, a closer example of the open path measurement head. So I'll give this time to align and focus. So inside the open path measurement head, you'll see a, a hole in the middle of that bowl shape here. The laser shoots out of that arrangement. It shoots out. It bounces off of a retroflector. And for our case, what a retroflector is are three flat plane meters that are butted right up beside each other. Uh, so what this does is the laser will enter those corner cubes and it will be it'll be returned at the exact same angle in which it has entered. So think of this as a as a really fancy mirror, so to speak. So this is what will return the laser light back to the transceiver. So to give you a closer look as to what the corner cube arrangements looks like they're a, a piece of machine metal a completely passive piece of equipment and what you have here are three flat plane mirrors butted together as i spin it you can see those as well and you can see the my camera upside down uh, here as well so just like the, the visual cue of this the light is returned at the same angle the laser light is, is returned on the same fraction as well so how this system works is we emit laser light at a specific frequency that is tuned to see that particular gas of interest. So why is that important? This is important because we see one gas and we see one gas only. So this makes us perfect for quantitative measurements. So we can tell you exactly which gas that we see and we can tell you exactly how much of that gas is present in that active measurement path. If any of that sounds complicated, I'm going to really simplify it here. So all our product is, is from our laser beam of where it travels, all the system does is where it's a simple molecule counter. So it simply looks, this system here, this is a, it's tuned to see methane. Uh, all the system does here is look for methane molecules. So I am going to move my camera to show you uh, a bottle of methane here. Uh, what we have, as I zoom in here and get out of the way, uh, what we have here are indicator lights that are tied to the relay module uh, outputs of this particular analyzer. So the green light that we're seeing here is, says the system is on, working, and functional. If I am to block the laser beam of this particular path, the relay will come on and activate, showing that we have a status condition of a beam block. So uh, a general fault condition and a beam block are treated differently under these sort of examples, but to help explain the functionality of this particular equipment and to demonstrate the sensitivity and the speed response of this, I am going to kind of chirp this uh, regulator here, this open this valve, and show you how quickly that this system responds to target gas. So these two indicator lights here are at a high and high, high alarm threshold point, and you can see how quickly that this system responds to having target gas molecules present in the active measurement path. I'll do a couple little kind of baby chirps and just hit the, the low light. Uh, we hit the, the low and the high kind of at the, at the same time here. But what is really interesting here is just as very minute amount of methane are introduced into that active measurement pack, I'll chirp it again. And you can just see uh, how quickly that this system responds to that as well. As we open it right up, you can see your high and high, high alarms come in. So you can set your dead bands to turn off and on as and where you please as well. Uh, but this is a it's part of the enhanced safety system because we can monitor long path lengths. And let me kind of clarify what long path lengths are uh, for these arrangements. So obviously this is quite short. So this is yeah just over six feet this active measurement path. So we can measure short path lengths like this or we can measure very long path lengths. For example, up to 1,500 feet is our, our longest recommended path length. Our per, longest permanently installed path length uh, is in the Middle East measuring H2S, and that is well over 3,600 feet as well. So this technology is ideal for short path lengths in tight, congested process building applications. This is ideal for outdoor process areas, and this is ideal for perimeter or fence line monitoring around a process unit or 
an entire facility as well. The one um, thing uh, that you did touch on there, so your your setup there that is behind you is tuned to methane, uh, and then you just referenced that you have a facility uh, with these installed that's looking for H2S. So I uh, want to make sure that everybody understands that the laser gas detector that we're talking about today does have the capability to do both combustible and toxic gas detection. So Kyle did mention that they're tuned for a specific gas, um, but what the, the gas finder allows you to do with multiple heads is you can have a tuned H2S, a tuned methane, maybe a tuned ammonia, HF. Uh, so you have the ability to actively look for more than one gas based on the number of heads that you have available for each gas finder. So uh, very cool technology that allows not only detection for hydrocarbons or combustibles, uh, but toxics as well. Excellent. So with this being an enhanced sensing element for your safety system, we talked about the large area coverage, like easily we go up to 1500 feet. The fast speed response, you can see I block my beam. The second that the beam is blocked, uh, the system responds to those particular target conditions. Even as I, I chirp and open a valve, it does not take long for the system to respond to this as well. So it has premier uh, technical benefits that significantly enhance the capabilities of your safety system. So performance alone, it's not even a fair competition between this enhanced sensing element and those of traditional fixed point gas detectors. Uh, Chad mentioned earlier on some very important points when it comes to the fail safe nature of this particular product and this particular technology. So this product here, unlike traditional fixed point gas detectors, um, they are not necessarily completely fail safe uh, instruments, detectors, or, or devices here. So, um, most traditional fixed point gas detectors cannot tell you if the sensors have become poisoned, fouled, whether they've fallen asleep, or become sick. Uh, the units provide no feedback to your safety system to say that your sensing element is on and is working. With this particular product, this particular technology, it has extremely sophisticated self-diagnostics that have no undisclosed failure modes, that the system says it is on and it is working. It can be trusted that your, your, safety, your, your crucial piece of your fire and gas safety system is in fact on and in fact working uh, for these as well. Um, another important point to talk about here is the fact that this system does not require any routine intervention or any routine calibration. So why this system does not require routine intervention or routine calibration is because of a patented feature that we have inside of this product right here. So inside the laser analyzer module here is uh, internal reference cells. So there's these small vials of glass that hold a very, very small uh, amount of the target gas of interest. So once every minute, the system will look through this internal reference cell and perform any sort of uh, adjustments uh, autonomously and automatically as well. So this essentially completely eliminates any sort of measurement drift. Uh, this can operate for years and years on end uh, without any intervention, any calibration, or any sort of additional work to go on to this. So thanks to its sophisticated self-diagnostics, thanks to its internal reference cell, there is no calibration, no continued um, operational cost required for this. So I come from uh, an instrument background previously. I worked for Shell uh, for quite a while before um, starting a position at Boyer Laser. So coming from the Shell world, I knew how important uh, the preventative maintenance schedules were, how important the whole safety culture is under these environments. So. To go tell an end user that this does not require any calibration or any routine intervention is one thing, but that's great. But that does not necessarily satisfy the requirements of your facility uh, or your particular instrument test plan or anything else like that. So we do have an optional accessory if you do require um, some sort of scheduled preventative maintenance. Uh, I'm going to show you how to perform. <laughs> One of the preventative maintenance kind of routines kind of for these as well so really simple really straightforward so i'm going to step 
to the camera, allow it to focus for a second. What we have here is in an, a reference cell. So inside of here, there is a tube of glass. In this case, it's filled with methane. Inside of here, we have a, a little retro flap if required, or we can move it out of the way. So your preventive maintenance routine is simply walking up to your active measurement path, placing this within the beam, exercising your alarm relays, and you have kind of fully functioned, uh, fully end-to-end -end tested the full functionality of this system, this system and this equipment. So it can be placed anywhere within the active measurement path. So let's show you once again, if the system is on and working, our low lights, our beam block status indication shows that there's been a change and uh, inhibition to the system. So that validates that functionality. But then we also have the ability to kind of come through and place this within the active measurement path uh, as well. So uh, just because this does not require any user intervention uh, or calibration does not mean that this system is a completely uh, set and forget system. For So if you still want to have a preventative maintenance tool, we do have this optional accessory. Um, very easy to use, uh, very easy to conduct uh, those tests as well. Uh, Chad, do you have anything to add to the uh, the, the functionality of the product, uh, the calibration, the internal reference cell, or the the fail-safe nature of this? Well, I, I you know, like you said, um, honestly, this is probably one of the most maintenance-free gas detectors you'll find anywhere uh, globally. Um, you know, Kyle says it's not set and forget. It's pretty darn close. Um, you know, one of the things that he'll touch on briefly. Uh, here in a minute is how easy the unit is to align uh, and lock into alignment when it, once it's been aligned. After the initial alignment has been completed, uh, there really is no maintenance left to do except what maybe you have from a site-specific standpoint. Um, you know, so that's where that test cell comes into play. You saw how quick and easy it was. It, it responds really fast. Um, so not only is it pretty much maintenance-free, but if you need to do any testing or calibration uh, with a test cell, um, the time required to do so is greatly reduced from walking around with bottles of gas, uh, calibration cups, making sure you've got the right regulator. Um, so there is a cost reduction there as well. Uh, no, no bottles of gas to keep using and go through and go from instrument to instrument. Uh, truly is also a one person verification. Um, no need for multiple people to be pulled away from something else in the facility to maintain this device. So um, extremely robust, Kyle. I don't I don't think we've touched on that yet, but obviously this is um, approved to go into hazardous locations. He did mention the SIL certifications or approvals. Um, extremely robust, extremely easy to use, but the amount of information and data that this can get you all the way down to the process level let alone gas detection level. So Kyle, I'll let you touch on that a little bit as well now. Uh, thanks, Chad. Yeah, Chad brings up a very good point that with this particular product, the main driver for this to be installed within industrial facilities or industrial leak detection applications is safety. The, the purpose is, is there a large enough leak present um, uh, to, to warn whether it's toxic combustible gases to allow for enough time for your safety system to to intervene to protect people and assets. But there are a number of other uses for this particular equipment that you're not gonna get out of your other traditional, simple fixed point gas detectors. So since this is a quantitative measurement, since we can tell exactly which gas that we see, since we can read in such low concentrations, since we can see, since we respond so quickly, there are multiple other stakeholders that can enjoy benefits from this particular equipment. So beyond safety applications, industrial hygienists can use this to either classify or declassify certain process unit or areas uh, for permissible exposure limit thresholds for this particular technology as well. Uh, so industrial hygienists are another group that can use this particular product. Another group that can use this are those kind of clever process engineers that are looking for ways to improve or enhance their leak detection and repair program. So whether it's the process engineers or whether it's the reliability team, this is a really good way to passively monitor 
looking for those small and incipient leaks. So for example, our methane system here, this is our a low range system. So this one is, yeah, proof PPB sort of sensitivity. Uh, but with our high range methane system, it can see 10 LFL meters. Uh, so extremely high concentration ranges, uh, but also can see atmospheric concentrations of methane as well. So what this means is you get the capabilities that no other technology will provide. You can see explosive level concentrations and you can see atmospheric concentrations of 2 ppm uh, over your path length as well. So an absolutely amazing uh, turn down ratio of being able to see low level concentrations and being able to see high level uh, concentrations of of this as well. Uh, other uses of this particular equipment, I guess I'll, I'll stay on the same one of that leak detection repair. This will pick up small little incipient leaks coming out of the packing of flanges, valves, everything else like that. So it gives a really good indication as to what's happening within your process building or within your process area as well. So in addition to this finding those easy to find large leaks, this will find those small little ones and give you a chance to intervene before it is too late as well. So in regards to your safety system, time is absolutely everything. And One thing there too, Kyle, is that the unit, this, this system is fully configurable from an alarm set point um, standpoint. So uh, even if you have those smaller leaks that maybe you don't want to alarm to, your alarm thresholds can be set higher than that, but it gives you the ability to maybe go and, and provide some maintenance to an area uh, before it becomes more severe. Absolutely. So it's one of those that you don't necessarily want to alarm at the lower level leaks, but there could be maintenance call uh, sort of indications or other sort of items that the reliability or operations team can look at and repair those small leaks before they become large ones. Another good example on this leak detection and repair application is the fact that we've had customers pay their systems off in a week by just finding small and seven little leaks coming out of packings of valves that once they find those small little leaks, they go with the wrench, tighten up the, the packing, and that saves the cost of the valve time and the downtime associated, particularly if there's no maintenance or bypass loop in there. To If you can extend the life of your valve or your process equipment, this is another technology that can do that as well. So this provides you with an additional set of eyes for an additional process variable out in your unit to know what is happening. So this is so much more than just a simple detector. This is this provides a whole host of, of additional information uh, as well. Um, as we kind of close up on the, the, the last minute of my scheduled talking time uh, here as well, a, another important kind of components to talk about here are some of the additional measurement heads that we have available. So above me here, we have uh, an extractive measurement cell. So what this is here, this enables you to tube in uh, process conditions, flow through uh, these arrangements. So you have process in, process out arrangement, and you can make direct non-contact measurements. Uh, these are available, fully customizable uh, tube length to justify your detectable range. Uh, we also have uh, stack and duct probe arrangements as well. So this is another really handy tool to make uh, in situ uh, direct and non-contact measurements. So as the name suggests, stack or duct, that seems pretty obvious, but a really good application for this product is for API 751 safe haven monitoring applications where you mount this to the... You mount this to the inlet duct of your HVAC system, and from there you can detect the presence of toxic or combustible gases the second it enters your HVAC system, rather than waiting 10, 30, a minute, uh, 30, 60 seconds uh, for your system to respond to that tar gas. So help prevent uh, gassing <laughs> and poisoning your, your individuals that are working within a, a controller next to the process unit or process area as well. So I'm going to set this down. I'm also going to get off my soapbox for for a second here and um, Nikki or Chad, if we wanted to open up the floor to questions, Chad and I'd be more than happy to, to answer any questions there may be. Yeah, sure, Nikki, um, why don't you go ahead and uh, and let us know what questions we have and, and Kyle and I'll do our best to answer. 
Yes, we do have a couple questions. So uh, the first question would be, how does the unit respond to dirty optics? That's a great question. Um, and I can talk about that and I can physically demonstrate uh, these as well. So what this system, how the system works, functions and performs is, I am going to talk about this. So this is an optically based instrument, as I think all of you have realized by now. Um, let's see if I can get my contrast to work here. Back. So what we have this is an optical based instrument and there's a certain amount of laser light that comes into the path and a certain amount that goes out. So in between the open path measurement head, uh, one of the functional tests for open path toxic gas detection, are, there's certain tests that can be done. So what we can do is we can use screens or meshes uh, to replicate uh, different opacity levels, uh, just like we have here as well. So part of the functional test for this particular technology and this particular product is to show how much transmittance that this system can handle. So I'll just kind of show you, you can see the there's a light bar here that shows the different variations as to what handles with these particular light level arrangements. Um, for this particular product, this particular technology, there is, a functional test that we use an opaque piece of glass that has a special coating on it called a neutral density filter and that particular product that particular functional test here demonstrates how much transmittance this system can handle our system and our technology can handle up to 97 percent beam block so we can lose we can operate with only three percent of returned laser light back and still have our plus or minus two percent of accuracy uh, reading and functionality as well but a rough rule of thumb is if we were to stand at the transceiver and we were to look at the retroflector for example even if with our transceiver configurations they come with a rifle scope mounted on top for easy optical alignment even looking through the rifle scope at maximum power or zoom as long as you can see the retroflector the system will still work and function so uh, dirty optics are not as much of an issue as one may think. There is a rain and dust hood that cowls over uh, the open path head here that does a very good job of keeping dirt, dust, and debris from building on the windows. The window of our open path head here is slightly angled. Another feature, another simple engineering fix to keep items from coating the windows. Okay. And, and if, for any, if for any reason something were to coat the window and dry, it would be the same thing as a beam block or dirty optics uh, indication, right? So you would just simply go and clean the window uh, gently. <laughs> um, but, but typically there is no, uh, I mean, Kyle, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but typically uh, nothing really much sticks to that window because of the protection and because of the angle uh, of the window itself. Um, but it will give you an indication, uh, like we said earlier, that if, if it can't see, it will tell you. Absolutely. And there's a very aggressive sort of rain and dust hood cowling on the retroflectors as well. So it is a more difficult for dirt, dust, debris, oil, whatever else to, to build on these as well. But the system does have a light level bar. The amount of laser light is receiving back. It is displayed on this HMI touchscreen on your heart communication loop. Uh, the secondary digitized variable also displays the laser light level on there as well. So there is a maintenance call sort of watch that you can have for these particular equipment. And once again, if you block the beam, there is a specific fault code that is displayed and is generated. You can't see here, but I have a, a milliamp readout here. When the beam is blocked and the status condition is enabled, the analog loop goes to 2.7 milliamps on the analog loop as well to notify you that there's a specific inhibition or status condition, that there is a, a low light scenario, which is very much different from a fault condition as well. Anything else, Chad, on that one? No, nope, I think we uh, I think we covered that one well. Good question. Um, and just a, a continuation um, of that question, how often is it recommended to clean the lens? That's a good one. 
So we have a rather cantankerous uh, service manager who will throw something at you if you ask how frequently you should have your uh, preventative maintenance uh, routine clean those windows. So it's one of those we do not recommend to clean the windows at all. So between the cowling of the hoods and the, the hoods on the retro reflectors, they do an extremely good job of keeping dirt, dust, and debris from building off of those. And on the retro reflectors, for outdoor applications, we include retro heaters inside of there that can be run off a 24 volt DC or 120 volt AC as well. So the tools and the engineering fixes that we have um, make it so that cleaning the windows is, is not something that should be done. And the only time it should be done is if your system says, hey, I do not have enough laser light to perform my analysis. So there, there, that was the long answer. The short answer is don't do it unless you need to. And it's in the manual in our PM as a specific note of do not include cleaning the windows on a, a routine or regular basis because it does, it, do, it could do more harm than it would do good in these particular scenarios. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, which gases can this technology detect? Excellent. Chad, you wanna you wanna take that one? So it's uh, um, it's a little more complicated than than it is just simple, I believe. So there there are a handful of combustibles and a handful of toxics, Kyle, that can be seen by the detector at different uh, levels and at different ranges, right? So um, I don't know if we touched on uh, long range, short range, or high level, short level readings. Um, can you touch on that briefly before I get into the specific gases? Absolutely. So with since we use lasers as our measurement sensor, and it's a, since it's an absorption spectroscopy instrument, there are multiple absorption lines that we get to choose from uh, for a particular application. So for most gases that we can detect, there is a high range. So uh, we can see very, very large concentrations, or we have a low range where it's focused for trace level concentrations. So we have combustible gases, methane is a good example there. Uh, then we also have toxic gases. So hydrogen fluoride, uh, H2S, so hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, uh, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen cyanide, uh, acetylene, ethylene, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Um, hydrogen oxygen. cyanide. Did you say hydrogen yeah. cyanide? Yeah. So hydrogen cyanide is in there as well. So there's a, a number of, yeah, there's the, the toxics that we do. That's really our strength. Of if you're looking for toxic open path gas detection, the tunable dial laser, the laser-based gas detection, is the ideal technology for toxic gas detection. Right, and then I, you know, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, carbon monoxide, methane, um, hydrogen sulfide. I think you already touched on. Um, yeah. you know, but but uh, so it, there, there's there's plenty of gases that are detectable, but typically we're tuning to one of those gases on, per head. Um, but the distance and the level of of what you're looking for for that specific gas can come into play. Um, and then if there's if there's a gas outside of the ones Kyle and I covered, uh, please let us know and we can look at and see if it's something that that the unit can be tuned to and then the reference cell is available for for the unit as well. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like we have time for one one last question. Um, and that question is, what applications in the power, oil, refining, and other industries do you have specific? specifically for ammonia detection? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we, we can touch on a lot there. So obviously ammonia can be present in, in many different applications. Um, you know, we come across it, you know, uh, believe it or not, in food and beverage for cooling uh, applications um, in different types of, of scenarios. Um, you know, whether there's facilities making uh, lemonade, orange juice, things like that. There can be ammonia present in their cooling or they keep keep the liquids cool. Um, ammonia, Kyle, we, you know, we, we've actually talked, oh, you've got to just go ahead. You've got a, I didn't see you had a rendering up there. Go ahead. Excellent. Perfect. So for ammonia specifically, there are a ton of applications. So within the oil and gas refining sector, we do have a uh, fence line ammonia monitoring applications. So there's a a refinery in California that's had our system installed since the early 90s 
that has been operational and been trouble free for 20 plus years as well. Um, other applications within power generation, oh, see if my camera can focus on, on me as well. I'll step forward and step back. Excellent. So within the power industry, so whether it's uh, coal fire power generation or anything in relation to uh, the reduction of, of NOx emissions, so sulfur catalytic reduction applications, uh, the use of ammonia and hydrous ammonia as a scrubbing agent in SCR applications. We can measure uh, for leaks at storage bullets and tanks and applications. Uh, in power applications, we can monitor for ammonia leaks in around the vaporizer or the diva skid applications there as well. And uh, certain other industries, if you're talking here, interested in fertilizer or anything else like that, there are numerous. So any sort of ammonia and hydrous ammonia handling, pumps, compressors, flange vats, like anything like that is ideal applications for, for TDL. So uh, traditional technologies have a hard time with ammonia where TDL is, is ideally suited for those applications as well. So the great part about this particular technology and even so for uh, ammonia applications is ammonia is devilishly difficult to keep in the pipe. And there always seems to be kind of a background concentration of ammonia in and around pumps, flange, compressors, anything else like that, where our particular technology, you can expose it to as much or as little uh, gas as you'd like without having to worry of poisoning, consuming, fouling, or degrading the performance of your system. So for ammonia, uh, TDL technology is as good as it gets and is the ideal premier sort of technology choice for ammonium water. Yeah, no oversaturation, no having to replace sensors, um, really, really good device. So just for an example of ammonia is both toxic at low concentration, but is also combustible as well in higher uh, concentrations. I think we've all seen the, the incident in the, in the news this week out of Beirut with the, uh, with the AN that possibly exploded there. Is another important point to point out is we can do toxic low-level concentrations of ammonia, but we also can see up to 100% ammonia as well. So we can see LAL concentrations in an open path scenario of ammonia as well. So if there is interest, we can do both toxic concentrations for personnel detection, but we can also monitor for LAL concentrations of ammonia to help hopefully prevent uh, incidents like that occurring. Okay, and we did have one other quick question that came in. Do you offer trial units? Well, for sure, yeah, we do. We have, uh, we definitely do trial units. Uh, we didn't really get a chance to touch on it, but it is in one of your handouts that we have portable units that are on carts uh, where we have the the transceiver uh, and, and the reflector unit uh, on magnets that really can be mounted anywhere in the field uh, just latched on very strong magnets. Don't put your fingers in there between them. But um, yeah, so portable units that can be totally standalone um, with a horn and strobe connected to it. So we definitely have uh, rental slash loaner units. Great for turnarounds, uh, short term applications, maybe. Uh, but uh, real good question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just Chad mentioned uh, for, for turnarounds, we do have, in addition to purchasing this equipment, we do have ideal turnaround sort of pieces of, uh, of uh, gas detection equipment that easily rolls out uh, into the field that has explosion proof plugs that you plug it directly into explosion proof fittings or cheater cords uh, it tilts back for easy stable alignment and then the, the measurement heads come with 100 pound magnets attached to them that you just affix it to a, a stainless steel i-beam or or anything else like that and it also in addition to local indication on the touch screen you do have a horn and strobe arrangement for a complete standalone uh, detection for there as well. Okay, and do do these units have wireless capability? Yeah, so with Heart 7, the detection capabilities, which is one of the communication outputs available for this particular product, uh, since we have Heart 7, you can connect to any one of the wireless, any one of the wireless transmitters or wireless heart networks as well. So there's about yeah, four or five different vendors that manufacture the wireless heart uh, capabilities, and any of those can be used uh, within this particular product uh, as well. So yes, 
uh, whether it's fixed gas detection or whether it's those portable gas carts, which you have the, the brochure as well, you can have wireless heart uh, communication protocols for this particular product as well. The other thing I wanted to touch on real quick, Kyle, that I, I don't know if we covered or not, but if you open up the front door there, um, there is a USB port inside the unit uh, for, for so you can extract the data out of the unit. Uh, I don't think we talked about pulling the, the data that's in there out and how much is, information is really available for the customer. Yeah, so inside of the unit, just on the side here is you can connect a, a USB stick and download all of the generated data from this particular system. So the system has its own built-in internal historian that the system can run for 20 years straight and uh, collect and store all of its generated data as well. So the nice part about this is there's nothing redacted, nothing hidden here that you as an end user have access to the exact same data uh, that we do at the factory. So nothing's hidden that you can go through. Of The data is extremely easy to interpret. It's a gas detector. Like your outputs on your analog tell you how much gas is present in the active measurement path. But if you want to extract every bit of quantitative analytical oomph out of this device, you can download the diagnostic data and get a really good sense of exactly what is happening with this analyzer as well. So out of the box, extremely easy to configure. It just tells you what gas concentrations there are there. But if you are consider yourself more of a power user or more of a sophisticated user of your analytical instrumentation, this provides you with every knob and dial to, to squeeze every bit of information and diagnostic data out of this equipment as well. Right, it also gives the customer the capability to send data to Vector or to Boreal uh, if you would like assistance in analyzing uh, maybe what's been happening at your facility. Uh, so it's extremely easy to take the data out and extremely easy to 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 email the data to Vector Controls or Boreal for further assistance. Okay, great. Well, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And we trust that it was a worthwhile experience and, and you learned a little bit from our experts. Um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Kyle and Chad for final takeaways. Well, uh, again, we'd just like to thank everybody for taking some time out of your day today to join us. Uh, hopefully uh, you found the uh, information very useful uh, and we were able to answer your questions. If you have any additional questions, feel free to use the contact information on the handout. Uh, you can contact me directly uh, and um, we'll, we'll answer any questions for you. Uh, any any deeper dives into details or any more technical uh, information you'd like, we can also handle that. Always happy to do more webinars or uh, come out and visit you face to face someday, hopefully. Uh, and just to kind of repeat the, the thanks for all of you for joining that, that chat Nikki had here is um, if you do have any more questions, we could easily dive deeper into the, the technical bit of this as well. But the more important item is is how you use it how you extract value out of it and how, how it makes your life better or easier in these sort of examples too. So we have a, a good database of case studies and examples that we can show you how other customers have deployed this equipment to help solve their problems and overcome challenges that they have as well. So there's a lot of expertise and knowledge uh, within Vector and in Borrelaser when it comes to the gas detection realm as well. So any questions when it comes to fire and gas, please feel free to contact Chad and uh, we'd be more than happy to, to, to work with you uh, as a partner uh, as well. So thank you very much for your, your time here today. Yes, thank have you. A, have a great rest of the day.